All right, we are live. Uh, this is our inaugural case study episode, and we're here with Doug Jewett from Red Notebook, uh, based out of Stewart, Florida. So, Doug, thanks a bunch for joining us today. Thank you. I look forward to this. Uh, so just to jump right into it, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, Red Notebook? Why did you create Red Notebook? What problems are you trying to solve? What the Red do? Notebook project is a system to putting all your documents in order. This came about because my parents were 800 miles away and they asked me to take over their finances for them. And I found that I needed particular documents uh, with them being that far away for their banking, for their medications, for uh, various things uh, legally that I needed to take care of. So I started compiling all these lists of things that, um, that someone would need to be able to manage their accounts uh, from a distance and realized that locally, here in Stewart particularly, that there are a lot of senior adults who live alone and they have family who live elsewhere. And for them to be able to get all of their stuff together, all of their documents together, this system would work for them. So it's a four phase system. Their medical system, uh, medical information where they are right now, their legal information right now, which includes their will and their power of attorney, um, their uh, desires for when they're still alive, but not able to take care of themselves. They need someone else to handle all of their affairs for them. And then the final phase is when they're gone and where everything is located. And all of those documents are stored on the application and, and uploaded there? It, it's actually a physical notebook first, um, but, it, but we de developed this through Cody's company to uh, go to an app that allows uh, me to put all the information at my desktop and to upload all of the documents that I want to upload, uh, take pictures of them, PDFs of them, scan them, whatever, load them in, and then I can access them mobily from my iPhone, my iPad, my tablet, uh, my laptop, and I could actually give the passwords, the passphrase to my children, and they could be able to manage all of the, uh, the information from a distance, wherever they are in the world, actually. That's very cool. So uh, what made you get in touch with Gunner Technology? Or how did you find us, and, and what did you need us to do for you? Cody and I were on a Pathfinders uh, team together at... Um, Jensen Beach High School, and I heard a little bit about what he was doing, so I said, hey, let's talk, and uh, this, is, this is how it's worked out. It's been great. Super. Yeah, and Cody, I, I, I can Cody. chime in a little bit there. Sure, yeah, I'm, yeah, a, yeah, go for I'm it. the meeting part of it. Yeah, that was, that was interesting because uh, to, to give a little background on the Pathfinders, um, it, it, since we're speaking to like a national audience here, and I don't yeah, know if yeah. Pathfinders are kind of a national thing, but here in Florida, uh, each high school selects a top candidate from a number of categories. I think there's like music, technology, business, athletics, uh, English, history. There's a lot of different subjects. And uh, Jensen Beach High School had the for forethought to kind of prepare these candidates by having mock interviews uh, at the high school. And then they go down south uh, to kind of do the real interviews among a panel. So Doug and I were on the mock panel and, and one of the groups that we had was technology and, and kind of just discussing technology among the candidates kind of got us starting. And we, uh, I, I think we first met at a, at a coffee shop and kind of, we, we kind of knew it was a fit right away because I, I know initially, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think that you had taken this idea to another company and it was pretty cost prohibitive, right, Doug? That's correct. Yeah, it was way, way, way up there. I couldn't even touch it. So, Cody, what did we end up? Uh, what did we end up doing for Doug? What solution did we come up for, up with for him? Yeah. So uh, basically, there was a, there was a couple of challenges. Um, number one, like like a lot of uh, the projects that we're starting for entrepreneurs, there's there's an initial budget which needs to go a long way, and when I say a long way, we wanted to develop an app that was ubiquitous, that would uh, work on an Android device, that would work on uh, an, an iPhone tablet, that would work, as, as Doug said, on a desktop. It would basically, heck, you could put it on your, uh, your uh, TVOS at home if you wanted to. Uh, so, but we didn't have budget to say, build a dedicated Android version, build a dedicated iOS version, build a dedicated Windows version and so forth and so on. So uh, we used React um, and we used Node.js to kind of build an, uh, a, a progressive web app as they're called, a, a P-A-W, yes, P-A-W, P-A-W, yes. No, P-W-A. P-W-A, that's right, that didn't sound right. A paw did not sound right, P-W-A. <laughs> so we built the, <laughs> built the app as a, as a P-W-A. Uh, it's hosted on Amazon. 
um, and, and it truly is ubiquitous. You can you can use it on any modern device, and it's going to work as well on your phone as as it is on your home screen projection television. Were there any other technical uh, hurdles that we had to get over? Sure, and and I'll parlay this from a technical hurdle into an implementation hurdle, or more of a business hurdle, because it's one that we're still trying to figure out. Uh, the technical hurdle we figured out, and that was basically the privacy component of this. And as you heard Doug's explanation, basically this is a repository for everyone's everything. So you're putting your most private information on there from bank accounts uh, to potentially medications to uh, to the location of your of your car keys. You know, uh, basically anything and everything can go in there. So that data needs to be super secure. So basically what we're doing is a, a bit of an unusual tactic, one that I haven't, we definitely hadn't used before and that I've only uh, seen a, uh, in a couple other places that is not exactly the same, but that's when the user signs up for the application along with a standard email and password and first name, last name, uh, they basically select, they don't select, they type in their own passphrase. And the passphrase I think has to be 10 characters long. Uh, and what this passphrase does is basically act as a decoder key. And so their sensitive data is encrypted using that 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 uh, encoder key. Um, and so it's what they say encrypted at rest, meaning it's it's on the device and it's encrypted. It's encrypted in transit because we send it encrypted and it also goes over SSL and it's encrypted at rest on the server side uh, 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 when it's stored in the database. Add to that, no one except for who the user chooses knows the decoder the, the decoder phrase. We don't store it in the database. We don't even store it to, uh, encrypted on the database. Uh, it's basically the person has to memorize it or write it down and put it in a safe location. Without that key, and again, we're, we're pretty secure with our with our AWS setup, so the chances of someone getting into the database are, are almost none. Uh, but even if someone were to get into the database, they'd be looking at a bunch of gobbledygook because uh, they don't have the key. And there's no way for them to get the key short of asking the, the person to give them their key. And I mean, like individually in person, ask them to give them their key. So that's an interesting uh, technical hurdle. Doug, were there any hurdles outside of the, the technical aspects? I assume storing uh, private data like this, there's probably a ton of stuff that you have to have to deal with there. Well, one of the things I looked at when I was putting all of the documents together is uh, I, I actually created the forms that have all of the numbers where you write them in, you, you put the agent's name for various insurance policies, you put the location, the phone numbers, everything. And then I realized that if I took a PDF of the front page of my insurance policy, it has all of that information on it. And if I hole punched that and put it in the notebook, then that was great. But if I scan it, then I can just upload that as a, as a file in that particular page of the, of the uh, app. And uh, I, had the, I had all the document right there. I could print it off anytime I needed to. If somebody needed to, to have an access to that, I could just go to my app, to turn my phone on, go to the app, print it, and, and uh, close it right back down. And what has people's reaction been to uh, this amazing ability to sort of have their lives in one place? They're scared to death. <laughs> they really so how, are. Yeah, and, and how do you how do you how do you get past that, or how do you how do you sort of there are the there are some folks who are trying it and testing it. Uh, we've done a thirty day free um, trial for anybody who wants to try it and see. Um, after that, if if they don't renew, if they don't um, if they don't continue to use it, then that information just as as Cody said, it's just garbage. It's just garbled up, and and nobody has access to it. So yeah, people are and, wanting, wanting to test it. They wanted to check it out. Yeah, and, and I was going to say, Doug, I was to add to that, that we're, um, and, and again, in the true fashion as we are with all, all our clients, with the app being released, that wasn't the end of our relationship. Doug and I still meet regularly to brainstorm ideas, uh, not only for the application technically, but um, how to overcome these mental hurdles. How do we convince someone that it's secure to put their, their livelihood, all their information online? And so one of the things we've discussed, and, and, I, and I think we're act, still actively looking for this, is kind of a, a partner, an established partner that has cachet in this sector that has the name, has trust. People, you know, 
for example, I, I almost use Wells Fargo, which would be a terrible example. But uh, let's say, you know, <laughs> if, if, if someone has a banking application and it's called um, Spendy, they have a, and it's called Spendy and they're trying to put, have everyone put their accounts on it. Uh, they may struggle, but if they then partner with Bank of America, then that or that adds cachet to Spendy and people are like, oh, okay, well, Bank America, Bank of America trusts Spendy. So probably I should too. So that's that's one of the the, the angles we're looking at to kind of overcome that hurdle, um, that that trust hurdle or that that digital fear, if you will. It seems like there's always trust hurdles with new technology. So uh, I don't think Red Notebook is alone in that in that aspect. Um, if I can change gears real quick, uh, Cody, can you talk about the technology stack that was used for Red Notebook? Yeah. So basically, it's our it's the it's the stack that we prefer to use uh, for our applications, which is a a, a serverless stack, meaning uh, we're able to keep the server costs at, at at a absolute minimum, which again was important in this project. And so basically. Uh, Doug is only paying for actual usage. He's not paying for a server just to sit around there and do nothing. He's paying when there's actual usage on the app um, from the technical standpoint. There's some there's some fees around the the processor and the the um, the Recurly account, which is the one that takes and manages the payments. Um, and and the database also has has some sit around costs, but the actual server doesn't exist. It's it's all on demand, meaning. When someone requests their data on Red Notebook or someone adds data to Red Notebook, instantaneously a, a mini server spins up to handle that one request. And as soon as that one request is done, that server is gone. Um, so we do that way. The, the database is a HIPAA compliant um, uh, 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 MongoDB actually. And so MongoDB is good for this, for the, especially good for this case because it's a, a document object model. And basically, if you think about it, it's a notebook. It's one big document. So what I mean by document object model is basically uh, instead of rows of data, like you would see in a spreadsheet, you have a key and that key has like a glob of data associated with it. And that's what I mean by document object model. So that fit this, this really well because basically every username is a key and their blob of data is their notebook. And what uh what project management methodologies did, did we use on this project? Yeah, so we used we use Agile, and it's been a while, so I, I struggled to think about it. But uh, Doug, I, I want to say pretty quickly, you were you were seeing things even though the application wasn't complete. I was sending you updates and sending you demos, even though we weren't. We probably only met like once a month, but I was probably sending you updates probably within you know a couple of weeks. And you were able to see, hey, there is an application. It's actually doing stuff. And then you were able to see that 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 application, uh, you know, expand into a, a true product. Um, so yeah, basically, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. And, that, and I was able to go in because of your video support. Um, I was able to go in and play around in it a little bit, even before it was uh, available uh, for me to develop completely. Right. So he, Doug is actually probably our closest <laughs> client. But even though closest to me anyway, uh, but even though he's so close, we, we didn't meet every day. Um, and so what I would do is I would record uh, documentation and this had the benefit of record my screen uh, using the application. So he would actually see what it looked like when I was using the application. This was able to train him. But if I'm if I'm correct, Doug, I think you also shared that with other people to help them learn to use the app as well. That's correct. It is on the website. And what I should say, the website is rednotebookproject.com. And you can get the app. You can get the app on the on the website as well. Realistically, the host of a show should say what the URL uh, is at the very beginning <laughs> yeah. of the show. But this is the inaugural episode, so uh, we'll cut ourselves some slack there. Um, Doug, what was your experience like uh, with agile methodologies? Did you uh, did you have a good time with that as far as the frequent updates? And was this your first experience with agile? Oh, yes. Oh, this is my first. Ex I'm a music guy. I, this is my first experience of technology completely. Uh, and it was there was quite a learning curve for me. But once I once I figured it out, it was a repetitive uh, system where you do the same thing on each page. And every page of the app relates to a page in the notebook. So I was just repeating. I was typing in whatever was on that page in the, in the physical notebook and creating it as part of the digital notebook. What, uh, what benefits have you seen from uh, 
this new technology stack that we built for you? I haven't seen a whole lot yet. I'm hoping to see a whole lot more real soon. <laughs> We're still learning a lot. <laughs> yeah, still what's the, a lot uh, as we go. What's the plan going forward as far as uh, growing the product and, and getting the word out? Well, Cody mentioned that earlier, trying to find a, a partner that will help us to give it the credibility of moving forward. Uh, I'm a one-man show, and uh, it's difficult to um, to promote and develop and market when you're by yourself. So um, I'm looking for someone that comes along and believes in the product enough that they want to help, uh, help join me with it. I think it's worth pointing out, Doug, that the physical notebook has enjoyed a lot of success. And you do do a lot of seminars for the physical notebook. The, Correct. The, 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 the problem has been, again, getting that, that, that person to make the leap from trusting what they put on a physical notebook to trusting what they put in a digital notebook. Correct. And I do have a seminar actually coming this Saturday at 930 right here at North Stewart Baptist Church. Uh, so if anybody wants to come and sit in on the on the seminar, they're always free. Uh, come and sit and listen, see the notebook itself, see how the product works and um, and uh, e examine it. You, you don't have to buy the product. You can come and look at it. We'll make sure to put a uh, put a link to that too in the description. Can I ask real quick, Doug? Uh, sure. From a, from the non technical perspective, it, it seems as if the the hard paper copy would be less secure than the digital copy. So can you talk about what people's hangups have been there? What the, yeah, what their big they, holdup is? They possess the physical copy themselves. I so see. They, I see. So it's at their home. It's in their hand. And actually, from the evacuation standpoint here in South Florida, if I needed to to quickly evacuate for a hurricane. I think we may have, have lost. everything I need for um, for the um, uh, to take with me if I need to evacuate quickly. I can grab my folder. I can grab my my storage binder, and I'm out the door with every important piece of paper that I need. However, if it's digital, then I can I can walk out with that as well and take it in my hand. And, and just to add to that, I I have I haven't been to a full seminar yet, Doug, but I've been to uh, the meeting that you had when you're explaining this to people. And uh, I basically did a QA and a with uh, some people who were interested in the application and were already users of the physical notebook. And the, the problem as I saw it was uh, akin to the false safety you think you have in ri driving a car versus flying in an airplane, where you're not actually more safe driving in a car, but you feel like you have control and you understand it. When you're a passenger in an airplane, you don't feel like you have control and you don't understand how that thing is actually staying in the air. Hint, it's physical. But you, you, you kind of, I saw that same sort of line of questioning where it was like, I, I just don't understand what the cloud is and why I should trust it. That was kind of and the line part of questioning of, that I was seeing. Another part of that, Cody, is that we're dealing with people who are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who are not sure they trust technology anyway. They're learning to trust it, but they're not there yet. And they do trust the physical page still. I mean, we, some of us still even get daily newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> it probably doesn't help either that there have been uh, widely publicized security breaches of Correct. major companies too. Yeah. So, yes. and Cody, can you talk about uh, maybe a little bit how our uh, development methodology and infrastructure uh, prevents that? Yeah. So uh, again, kind of going over, kind of skipping over the, how we move the data from encrypted uh, at rest in transit and then it, at rest once again. So whenever someone other than the owner would access the data, uh, it would be encrypted, but we have measures outside of that to prevent someone from accessing even the encrypted data. And so that's like, for example, only certain IP addresses can access our database. And an IP address, I'm sure most people will know what an IP address is, but it's the physical address uh, of your computer. Um, and so basically, uh, Derry, not even you, could, at, from your computer, access the database. Um, you would have to go through one of our Bastion servers to actually even access the database. So even, again, even if you and got the into access, the database- and the access to those servers is- also secured. Exactly. Secured, so. so we have like probably six layers of security around that. Um, the other thing that 
and, and again, <laughs> I hate to take a cheap shot at the media, but data <laughs> breaches, data breaches are like plane crashes. They're actually pretty rare. They're actually pretty rare and they're kind of gussied up in the media, if you will. So most data breaches are the kind where the attackers are getting access to the encrypted data. So yes, it is bad that attackers were able to get into the database at all. That That is bad. Don't get me wrong. But it's not the end of the world because they're getting access to encrypted data. And unless they can decrypt that data, it is useless to them. Now, things like the Equifax breach, and I think Target had a pretty bad one as well. Those are really, really bad uh, for sure. Just like some plane crashes are really, really bad. Uh, but those those very problematic breaches are so few and far between than what kind of the media makes it out to be. And are largely a result of an infrastructure that was entirely inferior. Right. And, and that's actually why people think that large companies <laughs> should be more secure but they're actually not always, but they can be less secure because they've been around for so long. The infrastructure has been handed from person to person to person. So the original person who set it up is not even there anymore. And so he may have had something in place where he knew how to handle it, but he forgot to tell the next person about it. And it just kind of got shuffled down the line until a hacker is like, oh, wow, they left the IP range open for this database. So it's actually in some respects, big companies have more of an incentive to have good security, but in a lot of cases, their longevity has, uh, uh, victory has been there or victory has defeated them. Kind of <laughs> to quote Bain. Um, Doug, can you, can you talk real quick? Cause this is like your first real technical project, right? This is the, the first experience you've had with developing an application. Correct. Can you talk, uh, or I guess maybe give advice to people who are in the same boat who maybe have you know, a great idea for an app or, or site or product who are sort of hesitant to, to jump in with both feet well, and try out the technical space? I know that working with Cody was really good. I, I appreciated his explanations. Uh, he talks over my head because he has so much more information than I could ever hold, but he's able to break it down to where I could actually do the work to input all of the information. Uh, I didn't understand that I was going to be doing that if, if initially, but what, what was so fun for me was that I was actually able to learn it and was able to repeat that, that uh, input over and over and over to learn a little bit more about how the process worked and was able to make suggestions. Could we do this? Could we do that? Which I thought that was, I was proud of myself. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could come up with something else that might be added to the, to the project. And it was not all just, it was very collaborative. It was really very collaborative. And I appreciated that with, with Gunner Technology, uh, the way Cody worked with me on that. And I guess going forward, what uh, are there any other big plans for the Red Novik project? Any any big dreams I can't, for I new can't features wait. and stuff like that? I can't wait. It'll be fun when it happens. Uh, at this point, no. I just really want to to get it off the ground. I want to see that that people are able to trust it and use it. I'd like to see it develop to be a a, a national uh, program. I do have it in Spanish, and that I'm working on. Uh, I don't know how we're going to put that into the app at this point. But I do have uh, the, the entire physical notebook translated into Spanish and uh, working to uh, be able to create that for uh, people who come to seminars uh, who would like to have it in another language. And to add to that, uh, obviously, I, I am biased, but I, I would encourage, as, as Doug mentioned, the audience has been older, 60, 70, 80. I have found a lot of use from the Red Notebook. It, it, it kind of opened my eyes when Doug was telling me like what it could be used for. And, and I used the example earlier. There's just so many things you don't think about. Like if, if, if you die, how, where are your car keys? You know, like wh who's going to move your car? You know, there's so many things that just trickle down that you just don't think about. And then when you think about it, you should put it down. And so it's just an easy way to record very secure, very sensitive information um, and then again, share it kind of with whoever you want to give that key to, um, you can share it in the case that, you know, the, the most unfortunate happens, um, you're not putting a, a more of a burden on those people that you're kind of leaving behind. One of the early inspirations for me on this was when I realized that my daughters had no idea where my retirement accounts were. They had no idea where my IRAs were. They had no idea where the money was that I've accumulated over all of my working life. They had no idea how to get to it. Sure, there are beneficiaries, and it might get to them at some point, but 
how could they find that? How could they have access to that information quickly and uh, be aggressive and, and directive on their side rather than waiting passively for someone else to make the contacts? So as I looked at all of those things, uh, insurance beneficiaries, banking beneficiaries, uh, powers of attorney, uh, healthcare surrogates, all of those things, all of that information that somebody needs to have access to, how do they get it if you don't have it prepared this way? And that's actually really interesting because it seems like today there's more information for each person than there's ever been in the history of the world, basically. Everyone has hundreds, if not thousands of accounts to manage and keep track of. Uh, so I guess, Doug, what, what's the range of stuff that you can store with the Red Notebook Project? Really could be any document that you have that you want to store. I, I even thought of putting in my credit card statements from month to month to month. And at the end of the year, I'd have all, all the credit card statements under the credit card page. I could go back and look at that. I'm sure I can store it on the, on, on the particular website for the credit card company. But I don't have to rely on them. I already have access to that in my own personal possession and I can go back and get those, those statements as I need them. My, my electric bill, my phone bill, my, and I could put all of those bills into the app and store them f for my own access as I, as I get through. I don't have to keep a paper copy that way. Uh, digital copies are there, but you have to go to the company to get those digital copies. I like to have control. <laughs> you know, you, you know, it's funny as you're as you're talking. We're talking about next step for the apps. I, I, I'm talking to a, a group of lawyers tomorrow about smart smart contracts and Ethereum, and uh, this is complex development here. But this is perfect. Not to go too far off the rails. Red Notebook is perfect for smart contracts, and to give you a very high level over smart contracts, uh, smart contracts are basically self executing contracts. So when a certain condition happens, these contracts execute, and they're completely secure. So, for example, you could put in a, con a smart contract for when Cody dies, give this key to Derry. And it's all handled electronically. It's all handled super securely. And it's executed, again, automatically with no middleman whatsoever. So, again, looking to the, that's combi combining two big aspects of where, techno where technology is heading. We're combining smart contracts on the blockchain with storing uh, your personal data health data uh, and financial data on the cloud. We actually had a comment on Facebook and Doug, you might be able to speak to examples of this being used. Uh, care for pets. Have you seen people using the Red Notebook project for that? Oh yes, indeed. That's one of our pages. Uh, as I explained in the seminars, when I tell folks about this, your pet is your child. And when something happens to you in the house and paramedics come in to take care of you, if it's a dog, they're going to be alerting, they're going to be yapping, they're going to be trying to protect the situation, they're going to be on edge. If there's an app, is a possibility of the page being available to the paramedic to say, call the animal by name, help to calm them down. And then in that same, on that same page, which we call it Vial of Life, it's a product that, we, that has been around for a while with American Red Cross. But if, that, if the uh, dog's name is there, if the cat's name is there, and the person who's supposed to come and pick up that animal in the, in the uh, time of necessity, plus the feeding schedule, plus their medication schedule, their potty schedule, everything about that as if it were their child, which it is, it's a special part of the family, but being able to have them taken care of in a valuable way rather than going to animal control or some other facility that uh, is going to not even know the animal. That's so cool. That's one of those things. It's, it's like you said, you don't really think about it until you have to think about it. Yeah. I've thought Cody, about a whole yeah. lot of things with this. <laughs> it seems like the applications are endless, basically. Um, Cody, real quick, can you talk to some of the, uh, I know this is a new application, so there's not really a, a legacy app that we can compare it to, but can you talk about some of the technical benefits uh, we've seen just from the way the application itself is implemented? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I guess, in, sorry, in addition to the security aspects we've already talked about. So uh, again, we're using... Uh, we're using React as the front end and we're using React as the front end and Node as the API. And so to, to break that down from not being techie, we have a lot, we have all the code to do the presentation um, on, on the device, whether that's the browser, whether that's the phone, whether that's the tablet, all that code that makes it look nice is, is on, the, on the device. 
And then the API is the code that's responsible for checking permissions. Like, does this person have access to retrieve this data um, and actually retrieving it? So the API is what goes into the database, gets the data and sends it back down to the client uh, to render it on the device. The, the benefit there is we're only sending bytes of data uh, down. So we're not using like hardly any bandwidth and it's very quick. It's very quick. So if you know anything about fast connections, when you have like a hundred megabyte down or versus like a two uh, KB down, like there's a big difference. So if, if we're sending a lot of data down the, 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 the pipe, it's going to take a long time to appear, but that data, the presentation data, the big bulk bulky data is already on the devices. We're just requesting the data, which is formatted very thinly to save on down, uh, down uh, bandwidth and be rendered extremely quickly. So just to sign us off here, Doug, uh, one last quick question. Can you, uh, can you talk about, I guess once more real quick, your experience with Gunner Technology for people out there who are looking for technology partners for ideas they have? If they have an idea that they'd like to examine as a possibility for technology, I think that Gunner Technology is a great place to start. Uh, if they start somewhere else, they'll come back to Gunner Technology because of the way that, that Cody works, the way that you all work, uh, the um, friendly uh, atmosphere, the, uh, the understanding of what the, the product is, and, and trying to, to get at what's needed te technologically, I think it's fantastic. Uh, I've appreciated very much what uh, what Gunner Technology has done. That's what we like to hear. Uh, we're going to end it there. Once again, the URL that I should have mentioned in the very beginning, www.rednotebookproject.com. Uh, make sure to check it out. It's an unbelievable product with uh, just an insane number of uses, stuff that you'd never think of. Uh, Doug, thank you so much again for joining us for this inaugural episode. Thanks, guys. Thanks, That'll Doug. do it for us. Thanks, guys.